Hello, boys and girls. How are you doing today? Good. Well, I wanted to read you a story from our story Bible. Um, this one, uh, Growing in God's Love. We haven't had Sunday school in a while, so I thought we could just look at uh, two stories from Jesus that are combined into one in uh, the story of something big and something small. Okay? So I'm going to read, and you can just listen along. Okay? God is big. How big? God is too big for us to imagine. Jesus helped people know God by telling stories about the realm of heaven. The realm of heaven is what it is like when everyone lives in God's ways all the time. Each story gives us a little picture of what this would be like. If you've ever heard us say the kingdom of God in church, same kind of thing, right? Um, it's just living the way that God would want us to live, right? Okay, let's go on. The realm of heaven is like a mustard seed. Hmm. Have you ever watched a caterpillar change into a butterfly? Or maybe have you seen a toy car change into a robot? Jesus compared the realm of heaven to how the mustard seed changes. Jesus said, a farmer plants tiny, tiny mustard seeds but from those little specks of a seed can grow a tree so big that birds can sit in its branches. Wow, right? And here's a picture for you. And do you see a little bird? Can you see a little bird here? Yes, right here, right? But this big tree, this big shrub, it, it came out of the teeny tiniest of seeds. It's almost so small you can't even see it, right? That's pretty amazing. The second story, the realm of heaven is like yeast. Hmm. Pretend that you are in a bakery. Have you ever been in a bakery where they bake bread and different things like that, right? Maybe cookies, different things. Pretend that you are in a bakery. Take a deep breath. Smell that freshly baked bread. Eat a slice of the warm bread. Mmm, isn't that tasty? Something powerful is hidden in that bread. It is yeast. Yeast makes the dough rise. Jesus told a story about a baker in order to explain that the realm of heaven is like a baker mixed yeast into 60 pounds of flour. Thanks to the yeast, the flour changed, or it was transformed into a large lump of dough. The dough was enough to bake bread for at least 100 people. These are just two stories about the realm of heaven that Jesus told. Wow, right? The, how these tiny things can grow so big, right? So we have to think of, you know, our... Um, actions and our ways that we can, in our small ways, contribute to uh, God's kingdom, uh, even though they're small, can grow to be uh, so big and have such a significance, right? Such an importance. So uh, we have three things here that I want us to consider. But before we do, let's look at the picture for the yeast story, right? Here we are. We have wonderful little baker here who is making some bread, right? And look at that big, big lump of dough, right? Wow. And look how many loaves of bread are there and they're baking here. It's amazing, right? But that dough can only get so big because of that little pinch of yeast that does its magic, right? Okay, so we're gonna do three things. If you have this Bible, you might remember there's here, see and act. So for the first one here, 60 pounds of flour is a lot of flour. How much do you weigh? Why do you think Jesus used so much flour in this story about the realm of heaven? Hmm. 
You can think about that one, right? Now, these are all questions, so you can think about them now or even throughout the week. Next one, C. Find mustard seeds in the spice aisle in the grocery store. Look at how small they are. These tiny seeds change into a big tree, enough for birds to sit in its branches. Why do you think that Jesus would talk about birds finding shelter from something that began so small? Hmm. It's a good question, right? Shelter. I'll think about that one this week too. And the last one is act. Act. The people who heard Jesus' story about yeast did not think about the yeast we buy in the grocery store today. The yeast they used was more like the starter used to bake sourdough bread. Ask someone to help you find a video on the internet about making sourdough bread. It'll be a lot more similar to what he's talking about. Try making some sourdough bread and sharing it with a friend. That's pretty cool, right? So um, he's just saying that uh, the kind of yeast that we have is not quite what Jesus might have used, but when you make sourdough bread, you might have tasted that before. It's very good. Different kind of bread, uh, but how to make that is a little bit more similar to this. So that would be a fun activity, right? To kind of put yourself in their shoes and maybe make something a little bit more similar. So this week, let's remember the power of the mustard seed and how it can grow so big. And that's how the kingdom of God is too. And just like the yeast, a little bit can become so big and make such a significance. So thank you so much for joining me today for a little bit of story time. And I will see you next time, boys and girls. Bye. Hi, friends. Thank you for joining me again for another prayer. This prayer comes right out of the book of Psalms. Let's pray. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is the sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord God Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. And here's a little bit more about this psalm. Psalm 84 has recently become popular through a beloved worship song written by Matt Redman in 2000. Not only is it sung in churches nationwide, it has been recorded by contemporary singers such as Chris Tomlin and the group Cutlass. The words unite listeners with the author, identified in the Bible as simply one of the sons of Korah, expressing a deep desire to be near the Almighty, who protects us, honors us, and withholds nothing good from us when we walk with him. And this is uh, a wonderful worship song. I would encourage you to look it up. It's called Better Is One Day, and it is lovely. Um, it's a wonderful worship song, and it helps us to remember um, just how valuable our time with God is in, in worship. So I'd invite you to listen to that tonight as well uh, as part of your devotional time, as it has been a meaningful song for me too. Well, thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time. Bye. Good evening, friends, and welcome to another installment of our Thursday Night Vespers. Uh, this evening, I would like a moment of personal privilege, and what I'd like to do is um, um, share something with our uh, graduates. I know it's been um, not the kind of uh, ending to your um, academic uh, 
uh, secondary school academic academic career that uh, one would like. Um, things have been postponed and changed, but um, I think people have been resilient and um, have come up with creative ways to celebrate um, your 12 years of uh, education as high school uh, graduates. Um, one of the things that I, I have done in the churches that I've served is um, I would gather the graduates around me at church in our worship service when we recognize them, and I would read them Dr. Seuss's story, uh, Oh, the Places You Will Go. So if you'll permit me, uh, I would like to share um, this profound, I think, um, story um, uh, which is applicable to us um, even as we grow older and make our way through life. I would also have uh, the graduates sign their names and the year that they graduated in the book, so hopefully I can catch up with you all and um, you'll be kind enough to do that for me. So here we go. Oh, the places you'll go. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know. And you are the guy or the gal who will decide where to go. You look up and down streets. Look them over with care. About some, you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not-so-good street. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there in the wide open air. Out there, things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along. You'll start happening, too. Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be best of the best. Wherever you go, you'll top all the rest. Except when you don't, because Sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch and your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump and the chances are, then, that you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. You will come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're darked. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn left or right, or right and three quarters, or maybe not quite, or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid, you will find, for a mind-maker-upper to make up his mind. You can get so 
confused that you'll start in to race down long wiggled roads at a breck naking pace and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space headed, I fear, toward a most useless place, the waiting place. For people just waiting, waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go or the mail to come or the rain to go or the phone to ring or the snow to snow or waiting around for a yes or a no or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting, perhaps, for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No! That's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying. You'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. With banner flip flapping once more, you'll ride high, ready for anything under the sky, ready because you're that kind of guy or gal. Oh, the places you'll go. There is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame. You'll be famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you win on TV. Except when they don't, because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not, alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go, though the weather be foul. On you will go, though your enemies prowl. On you will go, though the hack and cracks howl. Onward up many a frightening creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you will hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft, and never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So, be your name Buxbaum or Bixby or Bray or Mordecai Ali Van Allen O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way.
And lastly, I want to leave you with a couple of quotes from another sage, one that I like to quote often, Frederick Buechner. Two readings I'd like to share with you that I think are applicable for us today. These are his thoughts on adolescence. The ancient Druids are said to have taken a special interest in in-between things, like mistletoe, which is neither quite a plant nor quite a tree, and mist, which is neither quite rain nor quite air, and dreams, which are neither quite waking nor quite sleep. They believed that in such things as those, they were able to glimpse the mystery of two worlds at once. Adolescents can have the same glimpse by looking in a full-length mirror on back of the bathroom door, the opaque glance and the pimples, the fancy new nakedness they're all dressed up in with no place to go. The eyes full of secrets, they have a strong hunch everybody is on to. The shadowed brow, being not quite a child and not quite a grown-up either, is hard work, and they look it. Living in two worlds at once is no picnic. One of the worlds, of course, is innocence, self-forgetfulness, openness, playing for fun. The other is experience, self-consciousness, guardedness, playing for keeps. Some of us go on straddling them both, for years. The rich young ruler of the Gospels comes to mind in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. It is with all the recklessness of a child that he asks Jesus what he must do to be perfect. And when Jesus tells him to give everything to the poor, it is with all the prudence of a senior vice president of Morgan Guarantee that he walks sadly away. We become fully and undividedly human, I suppose, when we discover that the ultimate prudence is a kind of holy recklessness, and our passion for having finds peace in our passion for giving, and playing for keeps is itself the greatest fun. Once this has happened, and our adolescence is behind us at last, the delight of the child and the sagacity of the Supreme Court justice are largely indistinguishable. And lastly, something for you to keep in mind as you travel forward from this time of high school into adulting. Vocation comes from the Latin vocare, to call, and means the work a person is called to by God. There are all different kinds of voices calling you to all different kinds of work, and the problem is to find out which is the voice of God rather than of society, say, or the superego or self-interest. By and large, a good rule for finding out is this. The kind of work God usually calls us or calls you to is the kind of work, A, that you need to do, and B, that the world needs to have done. If you really get a kick out of your work, you've presumably met requirement A. But if your work is writing cigarette ads, the chances are you've missed requirement B. On the other hand, if your work is being a doctor in a leper colony, you have probably met requirement B. But if most of the time you're bored and depressed by it, uh, chances are you have not only bypassed A, but probably aren't helping your patients much either. Neither the Hair, shirt, nor the soft birth will do. The place God calls you to 
is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And my prayer for you, graduates, is that you will find that place as you travel the roads uh, ahead of you, as you uh, walk the great adventure and find all the places you will go. And my prayer is with the parents of those young men and women as they leave home and stretch their wings and find their way through our wonderfully complicated, simple, marvelous, beautiful world of ours. The Lord be with you. We'll see you Sunday morning.